The following sermon is from Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you've never reached out to Faith before, we'd like to hear from you. Visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. And now, here's Pastor Rudy. Okay, we're going to have all the children, ages 4 to the 6th grade, dismissed at this time to their children's church, and we're going to go and turn to Daniel 1 in our Bibles this morning. And as we said, we'll be focusing today on Daniel's convictions. He based all these on the Word of God, and they also came from a godly heart. Now in verse 8, we read that he purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. Now he had strong convictions, but they weren't welcomed, and they weren't accepted by the king and his entourage. So right off the bat, we, we learned that Daniel's convictions were in conflict with the world. And that's true of God's people today as well. So the question is, how are we going to carry out convictions that are not popular and not accepted by the society and the world around us? That's the heart and core of the message today. And uh, Daniel did have this conviction in his own heart that he wouldn't defile himself. Now defilement in the Old Testament dealt with two specific areas. Number one, it dealt with participating in anything that was considered uh, by the law to be unclean. For example, the Jews back then in the Old Testament, they couldn't eat pork, all right? It was considered unclean. I'm glad that's been lifted, and we can have, enjoy our pepperoni pizzas today. Uh, but they didn't have that back then. They, they couldn't eat pork. It was considered unclean. And if any Jew ate pork, then he was considered to be defiled. A second area would be anything that was forbidden by God at all. If you had a, a, a law there and, and a Jew did something that was not uh, acceptable and that it was forbidden by God, he was sinning and declared to be defiled. And here's the problem with that. Any, any Old Testament Israelite that was defiled could not be given access to the temple. Couldn't go in there and have his uh, sins atoned for and those animal sacrifices, couldn't worship God, couldn't get in there. And it also meant they couldn't be used of God in any way. That's why we never read of any of these other young men that had been held captive, that went down there to Babylon with Daniel and his friends. Not one of them is mentioned here in this record or used of the Lord, and that was because they had compromised their convictions and they had become defiled. But here are these four young men, Daniel and his three friends, that, that uh, took, took their stand for the Lord and God used them as a result. He blessed them. We saw this before all last time. God gave them supernatural gifts. He enabled them to be used of him. And Daniel in particular uh, was a man that God greatly used. Uh, God gave him these supernatural gifts, and we talked about that last time, and, and uh, dreams and visions. He could stand before the king, and uh, God uh, used him in a marvelous way. Now, in the weeks to come, we're going to see how Daniel w- would unlock the key to prophetic revelation. God gave him some, th- some uh, future revelation. It, it, just, it was amazing, and we're going to see this in just a few weeks, and Lord willing. But, uh, you know, here's the thing about all of that. I don't think Daniel ever would have gotten what what we have today in the book of Daniel, this revelation, had he not have kept himself pure in those early years of his life. God blessed him for that and gave him great, unusual uh, wisdom. So that's a real challenge to us today, especially young people. We need to uh, do what we know is right to do. And we've got to have convictions based on the Word of God. I always challenge everybody, especially young people, get some convictions uh, from the Word of God, stand on those. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything out there in the world. And, and so if we'll do that, you know, and, and dare to be like Daniel, stay away from what is unclean, uh, God's going to do a great work in our life as well. And we're not going to do what feels good or what fits in with the crowd, but just what God wants us to do. And God will bless us and he'll use us as well in a mighty way. So that's the beginning of this uh, this uh, passage we're going to look at today. Daniel and his friends didn't fit in with anybody else around them or anything else around them. But in the end, those other Jews that didn't have character, didn't have uh, convictions that they stood by, they vanished from the scene. You don't see anything about them. You don't have their names recorded. But that wasn't true of Daniel and his three friends. We got their names here in the scripture, recorded here, and uh, they have been read about and preached about by God's people throughout the ages of time. And we're going to see some more of these things here in the days ahead. But why was that again? Same thing. They lived by their convictions. God was able to use them. Here's a young man, Daniel, saying, I am not going to sell my purity. 
I'm not going to give in to the pressure, my peer pressure. I'm not going to follow the crowd to do wrong. I'm not going to get with the program. I just want God to use my life. That was Daniel's heart. And, uh, and it was very important. it's a very important principle, folks, of the Word of God that we need to apply today. We have a verse over there, a passage in 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 19 and 20. It says this, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So that's telling us that any Christian ought to keep ourselves pure from iniquity. Then it goes on to say this, if a man purge himself from these, he'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Then it says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So that's a passage that fits right in with what we're going to see today in Daniel, that if, we'll, if we will uh, just keep strong for the Lord and, and, uh, and keep ourselves pure. He's going to use our life. He's going to make us a blessing to other people. That was true of Daniel, and it can be true of us. Now, let's get into this outline this morning. I want, to, I want us to examine just a number of things here about what happens when you live by your convictions. The first thing we're going to take a look at is this. We need to stand for our biblical convictions. That's, that's where we'll start right here. Daniel had this strong conviction he couldn't eat the king's food. He wasn't going to drink the wine from the king's table. And it was really for one main reason. Nebuchadnezzar had dedicated all of his, this food and this drink unto his false god, a god by the name of Marduk. And so if Daniel was going to partake of this, he would have been identifying himself with that false god, and he was never going to defile himself that way. Okay, so he was going to stand for his convictions. Now, there were some other areas that, Daniel could, uh, could have uh, made a fuss about. For example, back there in verse 7, we saw that their names were changed. They had names that were named after Jehovah God. And the Babylonians changed those names to uh, be named after their false, their, their false god, Marduk. But there's nowhere in Daniel, where we, the book here, where we find Daniel making a big deal about that. Never fussing about how he had to bear this name of, of a false god. He wouldn't have chosen that, obviously. He didn't like it, okay? Um, but it wasn't a major conviction that he had. They could change his name. They could change his home, his textbooks, but they could not change Daniel's godly heart. They couldn't take away his character. And uh, so he and his friends, they purposed in their hearts. They were going to obey the Lord. They were, they were going to refuse to conform to the ungodly world around them. By the way, there, there's something else we can find from archaeology. It was said that back in that day, they dug this all up. The main palace where the king Nebuchadnezzar had lived, they had a large 60-foot statue of this false god Marduk. And it was made out of solid gold, not just a covering of gold. Can you imagine the, how much that thing would have been worth? 60-foot statue of this false god made out of gold. Now, every day, that meant Daniel and his friends when they came to work at the palace, they had to pass by that large statue to that false god. But again, nowhere in this book do we ever find Daniel making an issue of that. But later on, of course, we learn, and we're going to learn this real soon, Daniel must have been out of town, but Daniel and his, uh, or Daniel's friends were commanded, we're going to see this a little bit later in chapter 3, that they were to bow down to this large statue this, of this, to this false god. But again, nowhere in this book do we see that Daniel made an issue out of that. His three friends would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue there, and, and that cost them a trip to the fiery furnace. But of course, the Lord delivered them out of that. Later on, we find that Daniel is an older man. At the end of the, we see it in chapter 6. He was older by that time. Uh, Daniel was going to not quit praying, right? And he was cast into a den of hungry lions for that. He was willing to die uh, for his convictions, because that was getting into this area of his heart, allegiance to the Lord. And so the point I'm making right now is he didn't major on uh, the idol of Art Marduk being around, nor did he major on his name being changed to a false god. And right there, we can learn a, a simple little lesson that we need to be careful not to major on minor things. Take a stand on the right things, okay? But, uh, you know, for biblical convictions, 
But be careful, you don't fight for your own personal preferences or opinions or areas you might feel strongly about, but we only should fight for those areas that are based on the Word of God, biblical principles, and never compromise our convictions that are based on the Word of God. Now, Daniel gives us some insight here. In verse 13, we see that he had some flexibility even in the area of his convictions. We're going to get there here this morning. He was going to go as far as he possibly could in implementing his convictions. So the point, though, is we don't want to major on the minors. Make sure that we stand for what our major Bible convictions like Daniel did in his life. All right, so that's one thing. We, we need to stand. But let's notice a second truth here. I've just alluded to it, and that is this. We must implement our Bible convictions carefully or tactfully. Be careful how you do this. Daniel had strong convictions, but he was very wise and tactful in how he implemented those. Uh, we touched on this a little bit last week. In verse 8, we see that he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he not, might not defile himself. Notice right there, he didn't demand this, he requested it. And in verse 9, we're told that God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And then in verse 10, we find the prince of the eunuchs expressing his fear uh, that the king uh, wouldn't like this if he found out that uh, they weren't following his orders and, and he could have his head in danger to the king with Daniel's request. Historians tell us that besides Nebuchadnezzar's many talents, he was a very cruel man. I think the very first message in this series, we talked about that. He, he had a short fuse, uh, his temper. His rage was legendary. If this guy gave a subordinate an instruction to do something, then he found out later that he was disobeyed or all, this thing was altered in any way, Nebuchadnezzar was, he was the final word, right? His word was law. And as the judge, the Supreme Court judge, he would have, he would have had that person's head chopped off just, just for not following his orders. So we can take verse 10 literally, where this prince is saying here, look, Daniel, I love you. You're a good man, um, and I'd really like to help you out here, but you're, you're, what you're asking is way too much. You're, you, this could put my life on the line. It's a very difficult request to fulfill. I can't do it. Your request is denied. But we saw last time that Daniel wasn't going to give up, right? I mean, he had wisdom. God gave him that wisdom, and so what does he do? He goes to this, in verse 11, he goes to this guy, Melzar, who was a lower official uh, than, the, than the prince of the eunuchs, and he asked him, let us, let us you know, go through this test, this 10-day test, prove that, prove, uh, that uh, you know, we'll be okay. Give us some vegetables to eat, some water to drink. And, and uh, so they go on this diet for, for 10 days. The guy allows us to have. He consents to them. And so they go on that diet for 10 days. Like I said last week, I can't go on a diet for one day. But they, they did it for a week and a half. And in tactfully implementing his convictions... I want you to notice something here. How he does this is amazing. It's how we can properly appeal to our authorities as well. Let's look at what he does. First of all, he was very gracious in how he pursued his convictions. His spirit was, was, uh, was the thing here. It was, it was sweet. He, he didn't come to this guy and make any demands. Hey, you can't do this to us. You, you know, he didn't approach him with this holier-than-thou attitude. He didn't go to him and say, look, man, I have convictions, and I just outright deny, I'm, I refuse to follow this edict. Now, he could have done that, but it would have cost him his life, right, needlessly. But no, here's, here's Daniel. He goes in here, and he's, he's very gracious and, is, and humble in how he deals with this crisis. And, and we can learn from this. We may have strong convictions, but we need to be very careful that we maintain at the same time a tender and a gracious spirit. Our spirit should always be right in the sight of the Lord. I, I think what the Bible says uh, there in 2 Timothy 2.24, the servant of the Lord must not strive. That means he shouldn't be quarrelsome, but be gentle unto all men in meekness, instructing those that oppose. And that word means in opposition. So you go to those that are in opposition of where you are at and where you stand, but you still have the right kind of spirit. I think what one old evangelist used to say, have a tough hide, but a tender heart. And we can do that with, with God's help. Ephesians 4, 5, 15 tells us that. We're to be speaking 
the truth in love. So you take a stand on the truth, but you do it in love. And so that's what we need to do, folks. Be careful as a Bible believer to take a stand for the Lord, for his word, for the truth, but do that in love. Do that with a right spirit, humble, meek spirit. And that is so important. And that's what Daniel shows us here. He was kind. He, uh, he just had a spirit of meekness about him, a gracious spirit. He didn't parade his beliefs, right, to embarrass this guy in authority. But he honored his authority even though he didn't agree with him. So there's a great point right there we need to learn. Uh, have convictions without being cranky in your spirit. He can do that. All right? Now here's the second thing we see about Daniel. He's, he's wisely... Um, tactfully implementing his convictions. Here's the second thing we see here. He, he offers a reasonable alternative to his authority. Now, notice again, he didn't say, hey man, I got convictions. I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. I refuse to do it. Doesn't do that, does he? But instead, he gives an alternative to what he was being told to do. And it was, re- it was reasonable. He said, hey, please test your servants for 10 days. That wasn't very long, considering they had a three-year t- time of training ahead of them, right? Not, not too long. Also, that 10-day period would have been enough time to see that this diet was working, okay? So if, if in those 10 days these guys started looking sickly and pale and frail, they could be fattened up quick enough, right? I mean, 10 days, okay, you've had your test. You guys are looking terrible. Let's get that meat out here and that wine. Let's get going. Um, no, they didn't have to do that. It was a reasonable alternative. And by the way, here's another thing, too, uh, in case anybody wonders how they get. You ever wonder, like, sometimes you see something in the Bible, how'd they get along? How'd they get away with this? Ten days not having the same food and drink like these other guys. Well, here's what we also learned from archaeology, that the tables that were in the palace in the dining area were made to sit only four people that could fit at one table. And so it was only Daniel and his three friends that would have been sitting at this table to eat this alternative diet. The other guys would have never even known what was going on. They could have been, make sure their table was over here a little bit away from other people. And uh, so they, w- they wouldn't even have known what was happening. And that's a good thing, right? Because as the old saying goes, loose lips sh- sink ships. And they could have got Dan and his friends in trouble here. But, but no, it was, uh, it was all by themselves. So good thing that took place. So 10 days was long enough for Melzar to risk his head with the king. He was, he was willing to go along with it uh, because, again, he had respect for this young man, Daniel. Again, it's amazing to me. You look at this, you read this, hear this account, how God is always in control of everything. He was going to protect these young men for their stand for him and uh and so he gives this reasonable request that would keep him from fall, the, uh, falling defiling himself he'd be able to keep his his biblical convictions and melzar consented to their request so the bible tells us this too in proverbs 16 verse 7 when a man's ways please the lord he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him so daniel uh gave this alternative uh uh, thing here, okay, he was able to uh, uh, make sure that he, he kept his spirit right. And here's another thing we see here. He was flexible as well. Notice the last part of verse 13. Look at what he says here. Something comes out here. He, he says here, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he's talking about, okay, after these 10 days, take a look at our countenance. See how we look at, at we haven't eaten that, that rich food and, and wine and, uh, and then after that time, you can just deal with your servants. What's he saying right there? Well, he's saying there, if we fail this test and, uh, in, you know, in any way, then you can just deal with us any way you see fit, right? That's what he's saying right here. I, I do believe this, that Daniel knew that they were not going to fail this test. He, he was trusting God. He knew that God was going to take care of this whole situation and, and they weren't going to uh, be frail at all. And, and he believed that God would honor them for their convictions. They would come out of this thing looking better and healthier than any of the others. And that is exactly what happened. God meant all of this for their good and for his glory. He knew that if he just followed God, God and his word, it would be to his benefit. And that is so true. Daniel and his companions put all of their convictions on the line 
They implemented their convictions tactfully, had the right kind of spirit, and God blessed them for that. And that leads us to this third truth I want, I want us to take a look at here in closing. Here's the last thing we see, and it's this. We can then expect God to bless our biblical convictions. You take a stand, you, do it, you implement those convictions tactfully, and God's going to bless you for that. And uh, I think it's important to point out that it was Daniel who took the lead here in, in, in these, uh, having these kind of convictions. And, and, and he, he exerted, I believe, a tremendous influence on his three friends. It does, the text does seem to indicate that these other guys looked up to Daniel. Uh, he was their leader. He had these convictions, and they, they saw that uh, it was the right thing. So whenever we have these kind of convictions that are true and biblical, that we're willing to live out in our lives, here's the first thing I want to say about that. God's going to bless us with friends who have those same convictions. Okay? That's the first thing that happened here. Now, we're living today in a culture where people are saying things like, look, you know, your church, your church over there, you, can't, you cannot have old-fashioned convictions. You can't have... You know, that old-fashioned music, conservative music in your church. You can't have good, hard Bible preaching anymore and expect anybody to want to come out to that church, and, and your church won't grow. It won't even survive. And, and that's what we're hearing today. We're hearing things like you can't build a big church on, on that way. You have to be pragmatic, and that means you've got to do whatever it takes to build a crowd and be a, be a whole lot more relevant to your contemporary society. And you have to change your old-fashioned ways, or you're not going to survive. We're hearing that all the time, aren't we? We're hearing that all the time. How do we respond to that? Well, biblically, <laughs> uh, here's what we need to do. I, I do believe we can make some changes without ever having to compromise. Okay, You can adapt in a certain way sometimes to the culture, but we, we can never, must never, compromise the truth while you're doing that. My position, my position has always been this way. If you have to compromise your convictions that are based on the word of God to build your church, then we're just not going to have a big crowd. Okay, that's, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, why? Because we're going to all have to answer to God one day. And I do believe this, folks. If we'll have the right kind of convictions that are based on Scripture, God's going to bless us. He's going to raise up people that will have strong convictions as well. They're going to want to be in a place like this. That's what God did here. For Daniel. He blessed him by raising up these three godly young men to be by his side. And I do believe that he was, he would have been more than willing to stand alone if he had to. That was his heart. Um, and so, and yet God blessed him and, and uh, raised up these three other fellows to, to, uh, to stick right there by him. And they made up that big full table of four people <laughs> As they did that, and, and I think they had a great time of fellowship, too, when they were, we were having those dinners with vegetables and drinking some water, uh, but they had the right kind of convictions, and that's why they were blessed. And so that's one thing. God blesses them with, with friends. Here's another thing that happens. When you stay, take a stand for the word, God will bless you with even this, connections, connections. Now, everybody knows that any time a person goes out there into the business world, or just in any kind of way, uh, one of the most important things sometimes in life is the connections you have. And here's the thing, too. Uh, you know, we, we talked about, heard about this before. It's not always what you know, but who you know. You've heard that before, right? Um, but now here's the thing, folks. The, the, the deal is, uh, no, there's nobody we ever come across that's a, by an accident, right? Everybody we come across is a divine appointment. I believe that. Everybody we meet, God brings across our path, the circumstances, God arranges. And uh, you, can, I can, you can I look back and see that all, all through the years of our lives. You know, God blesses us with connections. And uh, the most important thing, of course, to, for a Bible believer, a Christian, is to know God. Right? You know God. <laughs> and that's the most important thing. Not what you know, but who you know. And in verse 9, we read about how the head honcho over these eunuchs came to favor young Daniel. And we read, too, that it was the Lord who brought this about. It says that God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now, the question really is this. Why did God do that? Why did he work this way and, and, and you know, in, in particular, bring Daniel into favor with this 
prince. Well, I believe that there were some reasons for it. I do believe, number one, it was because of Daniel's convictions. It was that simple, right? Verse 8, where he said, I'm not going to defile myself, comes before verse 9, when he's brought into tender favor. Secondly, this is the main point I'm making now. Because Daniel had these convictions, God blessed him. And we just saw that point. God was looking into this young man's heart, and he saw, okay, here was a man who was willing to live by his convictions. And even die for his convictions if he had to. Kind of reminds you of John the Baptist right there. Same thing. Had convictions and he was willing to live those out even if it meant he'd had to die for the Lord. That was the heart of Daniel as well. And so God said, here's a man I can use. And so the Lord knew that if he was going to use this man, he was going to have to arrange the affairs of his life, the circumstances, the connections that he had, so that he could grow and advance and be in a position to be used. Same thing happened, of course, with Joseph. I find a lot of common denominators there with with Daniel and John the Baptist and Joseph. They all had convictions. They all said, I'm going to stay pure. I'm not going to be defiled. And, And so God began to bless them, arrange all these different circumstances for them and put them in a place where they stood before the the Pharaoh in Joseph's case, and here uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's case. So the Lord providentially worked out all the details for Daniel to be greatly used of him. And so that's what we see here. God blessed him for convictions and arranged these connections. And then here's the third thing we see from this passage. God will bless us also with enabling gifts. And let's go to verse 17 again. We were there last time. But look at what it says here in verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, the truth is Daniel would have never been able to stand before all of those powerful kings in the years ahead even and interpret those dreams and give us insights into prophecy. And one of these things we're going to see here in a little bit is that he he talked about what we call the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles. You've heard that phrase. Jesus used it in Luke. The times of the Gentiles would have started with Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And that thing's going to go all the way till you get to the end of the tribulation period in the future when Jesus comes back to the earth. We're still living in the times of the Gentiles. And Daniel talks about that here in this book in chapter number 2. So if he had compromised, though, and didn't live out his convictions in his heart and life, I don't think that ever would have happened. But God looked in his heart. God said, this man has a heart for me, and I'm going to bless him for living out his convictions. And then here's the fourth thing we see here in the text. We see this principle that God may bless us even with advancement. Let's go to verse 18 and look at what it says here. Now, at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, that is after the whole entire three-year training, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And notice what happens in verse 19. And the king communed with them, that is, he gave them these, these oral final exams, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they... Before the king. Now, why did this happen? Why were they exalted? And that's what happened. We said last time. And when they're standing before the king, uh, what it's talking about here is that the king was placing them into a high position of authority, gave them some some great uh, opportunities. Why did that all happen? I believe it was because of the convictions they had. They stood for God and His word. They weren't going to defile themselves. They were going to stay away from those forbidden areas and be clean and pure. You know, I I believe if Daniel and his three friends were still around, they were alive today, you wouldn't find them watching any filthy TV programs, right? They wouldn't be watching any dirty movies or reading any bad material. They would have kept themselves pure. They would have been unspotted from the world. They would have been separated from the, under the Lord from sin. And so the Lord advanced them and he used them in a tremendous way. And I just want to say again this morning that, that we can expect the Lord to do the same thing for us when we take our stand for him. Now, whenever you do, 
take a stand for the Lord and, and live out your convictions, people aren't going to like it, just like in Daniel's day, just like in John the Baptist's day. People are not going to like that. They're going to put some heat on you. You're going to, you're going to take some flack for your convictions. You might suffer through a measure of persecution for living the right way for Christ. That's what Paul said would happen. All that live godly for in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But through it all, and in the end, God's going to always bless us for living out our convictions, for doing what is right. God puts his stamp of blessing on that. Now, as we close out this message today, here's a question that comes up often. What are, what are people going to do who've already defiled themselves? Right? That always comes up. People say, okay, preacher, this was good. You know, Daniel wouldn't defile himself, took a good stand. But what about me or somebody else I know that, that didn't stand and that did compromise and that, that defiled themselves? Well, believe it or not, there's a book way back in the Old Testament. It's the book of Leviticus. And it gives us some illustrations of what could be done if somebody had already been defiled. We have an example of one illustration in Leviticus chapter 14. There are the laws for how to cleanse and restore someone who had leprosy. When it looked like a man had been healed of leprosy, it was important for him to go in, they had to wash the whole house that he lived in, they had to even replaster the walls, and then, I don't get this one too well, but they would clean the entire house with blood. Now, we know that every person on the face of this earth has been defiled, right? With an old sin nature. We were born with that. And because of that, we sin. <laughs> and that's why Jesus came to this earth. That's why he had to shed his blood on that cross. The Bible says that when we look to Jesus and trust him to save us, his blood is applied to our heart. Our sins are washed away. We are made clean. I love that song. We are saved by the blood of the crucified one. And we are told this in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We're told in Romans 5 and verse 1 that we're justified by faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth, folks. When we put our faith in, in Jesus and his blood that was shed for us, our sins are washed away. We are forgiven judicially. That means it's just as if we had never sinned when we get saved. And then as a believer, hey, we can, we can trip up sometimes. You know, you, you do some things that aren't right, you sin. But we can still go to the Lord. We can confess that sin, repent of it, and then we're given personal forgiveness. So we're forgiven judicially when we trust Jesus as our Savior, and we're forgiven personally when we confess and turn from our sin as a believer. And we are, we are cleansed with His blood, and we can then walk with God. We have our fellowship with the Lord restored. We are filled with His joy and His peace, and we can be in a place where God can use us. Now, I think it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> we know it is to be cleansed by the precious blood of Calvary's Lamb. And I believe Daniel had joy and peace in his life. He was used of the Lord in a tremendous, powerful way because it all came back to what was in his heart. He had godly character. He had convictions that were based on the Word of God. And he was willing to live those out and keep himself pure and clean in God's sight. And God just, just blessed this man immensely. Now, as we, as we close out the message this morning, we're going to go to verse 21 again. I want you to notice again what happens here. Uh, well, we'll start with verse 20. It says, In all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them. He found them, that's Daniel and his three friends, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Imagine that. Ten times wiser than all these so-called soothsayers and Chaldeans and wise men and magicians. Daniel and his friends were ten times wiser. And this is a pagan king coming up with this one. And then verse 21. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. We talked about that last week as well, how Daniel obeyed the Lord. As a result, God blessed him with a long life. Most believe he lived into, at least into his up, uh, later 80s, probably his early 90s. And uh, he ministered under four, maybe even five different kings. You got Babylon and Persia, Medo-Persia. 
There are many Bible scholars who believe that Daniel lived long enough to write out the edict from King Cyrus of Persia that resulted in the Jews going back to their homeland. And uh, at the end of that, cap- and that ended the captivity. Now, here's the thing again I want to say. Had Daniel not lived out his convictions as a young man, I doubt that he would have ever enjoyed the victories and the blessings of his later years. But you know, his heart consecration gave him courage. His faith in the Lord made him faithful. And I just trust today that God will help you and I by his grace to have that same purpose in our hearts, that we're not going to defile ourselves. We're going to live by principles that are based on the word of God. We're going to keep Jesus Christ first in all that we do, and it's all for the honor and glory of our great God. Let's bow our heads together for closing prayer. And our Father, today we are so grateful for how you use this young man, Daniel. Lord, we know that this is not a very popular subject today. We're talking about convictions, and especially in a day like we live in, Lord, where there's so much compromise going on. But Lord, we thank you that we have truth right here that we can look at and learn from and apply to our own hearts and lives. Lord, help us today to see in Daniel's example the importance of having in our heart convictions that are based on your word, that we're willing to live out on a daily basis. And Lord, we're not doing it just to get the blessing, but we're doing it because we know that it will honor you. It'll please you and glorify you. And that's, Lord, what we want in our life, to to honor you and exalt you in all that we say and do. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that uh, maybe has been defiled by sin and hasn't dealt with that and, and gone to you and got that remedied, Lord, I pray for that person today. If there's anyone like that, the sound of my voice. I pray you'll work in their heart, Lord. Help them to come to the one who can cleanse them. And that, of course, is Jesus. And I pray, Lord, you'll do a work in their heart for your glory as well. In Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen. You've been listening to Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. Thank you for listening.